All right. Well, it is seven o'clock, so I think we'll get started. Um, we've got a little bit of housekeeping I just want to get started with. First, I want to introduce myself. My name is Erin Benz. I'm the collections manager for the Montclair History Center. Uh, if you were just joining us, Helen was just saying uh, Jane is out tonight, so I'm her filler in, so I'll be the filler moderator tonight. Um, but a few housekeeping things, like I mentioned. So uh, first off, we had some technical difficulty issues at noon today. So if you guys tried to come on at noon, First off, apologies for that. But second off, I'm glad you could join us this evening. Uh, if you know anybody who wasn't able to join us this evening but really wanted to watch it, not to worry, we do record all of our presentations. Uh, we post them on our YouTube page. You can find a link to our YouTube page on the front page of our website. Uh, that should That usually goes up uh, within a week or two of the recording. So hopefully this one will be up on our YouTube page by the end of the month just in time for the end of the spooky month here. A um, couple other things, uh, if you'd like to donate, we are able to do these events, these History at Homes for free. We've been running them since last March and we've been able to be able to run them for free this entire time. We greatly appreciate your support. Just showing up is a great way to support us, so thank you. Um, but if you wanna donate, we do uh, always, will be happy for any amount of donation that you can give. Um, we take checks, cash, we do Venmo, Zelle, um, or we can donate right on our website. All of that information is right on our website. If you go to montclairhistory.org, under the support us tab, you'll see ways to donate and ways to support us. Um, but I'm gonna pass it on now to the leading ladies of the night. Uh, tonight, we've got Liz Ann Renner, who's a historian and from the Friends of Anderson Park. And we also have Helen Fallon, who's our trustee of the Montclair History Center here. So I'm gonna let those two ladies Take it away. Thanks, Erin. Um, Lisa Ann and I are really happy to present this slideshow. We, we've done this walking tour many times and we're happy to work together again to present it. It's a slideshow. Lisa Ann, you get us rolling. Thank you, Helen. Well, welcome everybody to Mount Hebron Cemetery. It's a silent city with a population of about 18,200 people in Upper Montclair, just across Valley Road from Montclair State University. It was named by one of its founders, Peter G. Spear, for a passage in Genesis 23 that tells of Abraham buying a cave in Hebron in which to bury his wife, Sarah. Although the name has biblical origins, this cemetery is not affiliated with any religion or a part of a churchyard. It was incorporated while the Civil War was raging on March 23, 1863, as part of the Rural Cemetery Movement, also known as the Garden Cemetery Movement. These type, this new type of cemetery or burial ground was picturesque, non-denominational, and not attached to a church. These cemeteries tended to be just outside of urban areas. Even before there was awareness of germ theory in the late 19th century, people knew that decaying bodies were not a healthy thing to have near residences and city centers. The um, rural cemetery movement was a direct outgrowth of these local laws beginning in the 1820s to restrict burial locations after epidemics in cities. Now, rural cemeteries were distinct from traditional church graveyards or from private burial plots on farms. The, their architecture is a direct rejection of the concept of a spooky graveyard. These, they do not have a Halloween vibe whatsoever. They're meant to be beautiful places of rest and reflection. The Mount Auburn Cemetery in Cambridge, Massachusetts became the first rural cemetery in 1831. It even had its own guidebook, which you can see here. Then Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn soon followed in 1838. And by the early 1860s, it had become a prestigious place to be buried and it attracted 500,000 visitors a year, second only to Niagara Falls as the nation's greatest tourist attraction. It's also now a National Historic Landmark. The very word cemetery comes from the Greek for sleeping chamber, and it was a word that was rarely used before the rural cemetery movement. Now these rural cemeteries are characterized by dense plantings, gentle contours, picturesque vistas, varied monuments, and winding paths. 
Their designs are based on English and French precedences. Um, they offer a more soothing and sentimental view of death as a place of eternal rest, hence the idea of a cemetery as a sleeping chamber, and also a return to the garden, hence park-like sundials, benches and bird baths, which you see many of in Mount Hebron Cemetery. The emphasis here is on a romantic aesthetic, pastoral beauty and naturalistic features. I've even seen Montclair State University students sitting on these benches with their laptops, just as if they were sitting in a park. One other feature of these types of cemeteries was often an elevated view. In the case of Mount Hebron, this view overlooks the skyscrapers of New York City. Um, now this spectacular skyline, of course, didn't exist in the 1860s, but it was still nevertheless an elevated view as Henry Whittemore wrote about as early as 1894. And even the headstones uh, reflect the sentiments of a more soothing view of death than you would see in an old, more old fashioned cemetery. Here, um, Charles Jacobus is just asleep. The rural cemetery movement began a direct line of evolution to parks and to picturesque suburbs such as Llewellyn Park in West Orange, New Jersey. In this photo, which is Woodland Cemetery in Dayton, Ohio, residents are actually using the cemetery very much as we would use a park. It was also not at all uncommon for people to picnic in cemeteries as they're doing here at St. Luke's Historic Cemetery in Springfield, Virginia, probably around the 1830s. And if you look carefully, it appears that the three women in the foreground are actually sitting on a tabletop style headstone as they eat. Since its creation in 1863, Mount Hebron Cemetery has grown from 2.5 acres to 30 acres. Um, these are minutes from the Mount Hebron Cemetery Association. Uh, the office at the cemetery has all the minutes in their archives, even those from the first organizational meeting, which chronicled the cemetery's growth and development. Um, on this 1865 map, we see the original footprint of the cemetery. Here it is circled in yellow. I'm also going to try to give you some bearings here. This is Valley Road, and this is Mount Hebron, uh, Mount Hebron Crossing Road. This um, uh, this was all this was a corner of farmland owned by Peter G. Spear. Here we go, and um, this part of town north of Watchung Avenue was known as Spear Town and had been settled by the Spears and other farming families of Dutch descent. In this picture, we see on the left the Hamilton family plot, um, which is demarcated by a well-preserved stone fence. This is in the oldest section of the cemetery near the original Mount Hebron Road entrance. You see these stone, um, these stone rails. And often, if you look closely in this cemetery and in others, you'll see the remnants of something like this, but this one's in incredibly good condition. But some graves, other graves in this area of the cemetery predate 1863, lending credence to the theory that this corner may have served as an informal burial ground prior to the official formation of the Mount Hebron, Hebron Cemetery Association in 1863. In this 1901 map, um, we can see the, um, the names of the interior roads. And at this point, the cemetery is 18 acres. In 1906, the cemetery has still not reached its final size and it won't until 1923 when these uh, remaining 12 acres are, um, are purchased from Thomas Van Riper. Uh, the map provides a very good context of the cemetery um, in its relationship to the surrounding properties. So former spear land, what had been spear land all across here is now in the name of Thomas Van Riper. Um, that is Thomas, that is Peter Spears' son-in-law. And we clearly see that the Mount Hebron Cemetery is adjacent to another cemetery, the Catholic Cemetery, the Immaculate Conception Cemetery, which was established in 1896. Many people still today don't realize that there are actually two separate cemeteries right next to each other. The 1933 Atlas finally shows the cemetery extending all the way to Normal Avenue and encompassing its full 30 
acres. And just um, a little aside, you see that it bumps right up to the county line, Essex County, Passaic County, and also since the last map, um, you may notice that the county line, which used to go straight across, has now been bumped up a little bit so that the state normal school, what's now Montclair State, is in Montclair instead of Little Falls, interestingly. It's worth revisiting the Spear Van Riper family since they are so integral to the cemetery's development. Um, both Peter G. Spear, shown here on the left, and his son-in-law, Thomas Van Riper, were among the 14 founders of the Mount Hebron Cemetery Association in 1863. This obelisk, one of the nicest in the cemetery, memorializes this family. If we're standing here near the entrance of the cemetery, looking west or uphill, um, you see the house that Carol, Carolyn Spear and Peter, uh, Peter Spears' daughter and her husband, Thomas Van Riper, built in 1872 on land given to them by Peter Spear as a wedding present. Um, it was considered a pretty fancy house in 1872, for sure. The couple donated property that would become a large part of the cemetery. MSU now owns this hilltop property and this house. It's today more commonly referred to as the Bond House because of the Bond family of local ice cream parlor fame that lived there from the early 1950s to when they donated the house to Montclair State in the mid 1960s. And this building here in the foreground, um, the cemetery office is said to stand where a spear milking barn once was. After donating the land to the cemetery, Carolyn Spear and Thomas Van Riper requested that the corner of Valley Road and Mount Haven Road be made available for the construction of a church, the former Montclair Heights Reform Church which was built approximately in 1901. It's now a different congregation. Um, but to be clear, despite Mount Hebron Cemetery being right next to this church, it's not a church graveyard and many of those interred have no association with the church. But we love the opportunity to show this construction photo on the left. Um, can you imagine doing construction in the horse and buggy days? And on the right, you might um, note that the, this fence that is surrounding the Mount Hebron uh, or the Mount uh, the Mount Heights Reform Church, originally um, it was originally there. Uh, it's no longer there, but this same fence continues to encircle the cemetery. As I mentioned, the Catholic Immaculate Conception Cemetery opened to the east of Mount Hebron, so it's over here um, in 1896. That was 33 years after Mount Hebron was formed. In this photo, you get a glimpse of how the linear design of Immaculate Conception um, contrasts with the more organic layout and naturalistic landscape at Mount Hebron. Uh, as an aside, note this um, really beautiful spherical polished granite ball in the foreground. It's one of our favorites. Um, it's for Annie, B, Annie M. Wolf. She's a bit of a mystery woman, but we do know that she died in 1903 of tuberculosis. Um, it's a, considered, it would have been considered a very fancy and expensive headstone in its day, um, as headstones go, and we believe it's the only one of its kind in Mount Hebron. There are some like this in Rosedale, and on a recent trip to Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, I saw um, many more of this type of headstone. So headstones are full of symbolism and interpreting these symbols can be subjective and squishy, but we can offer some interpretations for you to consider. Um, one of them is the open book. Uh, this is uh, considered a book for registering the name of the deceased or faith or learning accomplishment and a closed book would symbolize a completed life. Um, a similar concept is the scroll and that uh, represents life and time, honor and commemoration. The hourglass, of course, represents the inevitable passing of time. And in this case, the clasped hands symbolize a final goodbye, as they do for Maria Mandeville, who died in 1910. The lamb, unfortunately, in this case, the lamb is decapitated, but the lamb is often appears on children's graves and symbolizes the innocence of childhood. Um, lilies symbolize purity, innocence, and heavenly bliss, and they are particularly fitting on this headstone for Ethelbert Furlong, who was a landscape architect, and is the headstone says, a quote, creator of beautiful gardens. 
The upturned torch represents enlightenment. And the inverted torch uh, with the flame suggests a life that life continues after death. And in this case, it's on the headstone of Union Noble Bethel, who joined um, many small phone companies to create AT&T. He was a very prominent figure in Montclair before he died in 1933. The draped urn is a very common 19th century funerary symbol. It represents the veil or the curtain that separates the holy place from the holy of holies in the temple, which was torn in two when Jesus was crucified. It symbolizes the boundary between heaven and earth or the passage from one existence into another. Um, also, the drapery can express mourning or sorrow, and the urn can represent ashes to ashes, as an urn may be filled with ashes, a person's ashes. The wreath, as you see here, um, can symbolize victory in death, or also the crown worn by a triumphant believer. Wings speak to the ascent into heaven, and here in this 1931 headstone, we have a particularly lovely Art Deco stylization of wings. The cut down tree trunk suggests a life interrupted or a life cut short. And in a similar vein, the partially rusticated headstone in which the headstone is partially finished and partially rough suggests a life interrupted or a life left unfinished. The obelisk is a reverential monument that goes all the way back to the ancient Egyptians who used it to commemorate the dead. Um, one of the people whose names is carved into the granite on this particular obelisk is Samuel Pope. He was a soldier in the War of 1812 who died in 1814, which was decades before this cemetery was incorporated. So we're not sure whether he is actually physically buried here, i.e. moved from somewhere else, or if his name on this obelisk is simply a form of family record keeping, um, just a place to document his life, even though he may not actually be buried here. The Weeping Willow suggests immortality, life after death, and the resurrection of the soul. The rising sun suggests rebirth or eternal light, whereas the setting sun could mean the end of earthly life. There are many other symbols that appear on headstones, um, plenty of them related to plants. Uh, they have an organic connection. Um, I'll just point out one which I like in particular is the one for ivy, which um, speaks to abiding memory, friendship, and fidelity. Now we'll highlight some notable people, but first, um, uh, uh, the first one we'll talk about is Alan Dumont, who died in um, 1965. He was one of many inventors and early adopters who are buried here. He invented the first commercial TV set by perfecting the cathode ray tube in 1940. Dumont Laboratories was the first American company to sell TV sets to the public. He, he also started a TV network. He actually grew up in Montclair and then lived as an adult on the border of Montclair and Cedar Grove. Uh, his first lab was in his garage uh, on that right there on the top of First Mountain, and the next one was on Valley Road, where Brick Lane is today. Uh, he was also an early innovator in the use of radar and shared the technology with others to help in the war effort during World War II. Alfred Morgan was an early pioneer in wireless communication and produced early radio receivers and transmitters. He was the president of the Adams Morgan Radio Company in the late teens and early 1920s, and his factory was where the Studio Players Theater now is. The cemetery also reflects the arts and cultural vibe of Montclair. Shirley Booth Baker died in 1992. She was an actress who was perhaps best known on TV when, uh, for when she played uh, a maid on the 1960s TV show, Hazel. She worked for Mr. Baxter, but she was also very active on stage. She's buried in her husband's family plot. She's married to a man whose name was, last name was Baker. 
we're told that at one time this was the most searched for grave site in the cemetery. Walter and Emily Greeno were artist uh, colony members who joined George and his senior in Montclair in 1890. They built their home at 340 Highland Avenue near Bradford Avenue in the late 1890s. They met while painting stained glass for um, John Lafarge in the John Lafarge studio. Walter also designed book covers, staged plays, and was experimenting with early photography. Emily painted portraits and landscapes such as the one shown. Unfortunately, Walter died soon after they moved here and she lived as a widow for many years. According to Greeno family lore, the large holly tree in, the plot, in their plot was not planted, but grew from a berry from Walter's burial wreath. Herman Hupfeld died in, in 1951. He was a composer and lyricist, perhaps best known for writing As Tom, Time Goes By, which was featured in the movie Casablanca in 1931. He also composed the Princeton football fight song, Here Comes That Tiger. He lived at 259 Park Street, and before he was better known, he worked the piano bar at the Dry Grill Leon restaurant on Church Street three times a week during Prohibition. Lawrence Osgood Rand Lang was the daughter of Jasper and Annie Rand. Jasper had made a fortune manufacturing rock drills and mining machinery, um, and his company would later become Ingersoll Rand. Florence, um, who was an artist in her own right, donated the first $50,000 to help establish the Montclair Art Museum in 1914. She would also donate her mother's extensive Native American artifact collection. Augustus Studer was the founder, editor, and owner of the Montclair Times, established in 1877. In 1876, he had come to Montclair from Newark, got off the train, and trudged through the snow to canvas, canvas community leaders on the chances of a newspaper succeeding here in town. Donald Mulford was the publisher of the Montclair Times from 1979 to 1989. He had started working there in 1940. His first major story as a journalist was the Hindenburg explosion in Lakehurst, New Jersey, while as still a student reporter at the Daily Princetonian. He was later a World War II combat correspondent in the Pacific. He was a founder of the Montclair Adult School. George Walker died fairly recently in 2018. He was a composer and pianist. In 1996, he became the first Black composer to win the Pulitzer Prize for Music with Lilacs, which was based on Walt Whitman's lament for Abraham Lincoln. In architecture, we have Effingham R. North, who died in 1935. He was the architect of many notable Montclair homes, but perhaps um, best known for the Valley Road Fire Station in Upper Montclair, which was built in 1902 and is on the National Register of Historic Places. Dudley Van Antwerp was another very prolific architect in Montclair and died in 1934. The homes he designed range in style from craftsman to Tudor revival and colonial revival, and he has a pretty unusual headstone. In business, we have Ernest C. Hink Sr. He was a, the mayor of Montclair from 1911 to 1915, and he was also a developer. He built the mission style Hink building in 1921 at 31 Church Street, where today's anthropology is. And with family members, he developed the residential area that includes Christopher Street, which was named after his father, as, as well as Ardley Road and Tremont Place. Benjamin Moore, yes, that Benjamin Moore of the paint company uh, is buried here. He died in 1917. Um, he lived on Upper Mountain Avenue, north of Bellevue. Actually, in the course of preparing this presentation, we stumbled on a bit of a mystery into whether Benjamin Moore is actually buried here. His death certificate and a Brooklyn newspaper account say he's buried in Greenwood Cemetery in Brooklyn, but Mount Hebron records say he's buried here. After communicating with the historian at Greenwood Cemetery, we feel that he probably is most likely actually buried here in Mount Hebron Cemetery in Montclair. And we'll highlight two politicians. Senator Albert Hawks, who was a New Jersey Republican Senator from 1943 to 1949 and professionally had worked in the chemical industry as the president of Congolium. And Winona Moore Lipman, um, who died in 1999, was the first Black New Jersey Senator elected in 1971. She was a Democrat. She had become an activist in Montclair as a mother angry about town trucks dumping dirty snow in the playground. 
Her headstone reads, Trailblazer for Women and Children. Um, there are a number of notable sports figures buried here, the first of whom is Clary Anderson, who died in 1988. As a Montclair High School student, he was a fullback and a quarterback in college at Colgate, um, and then he became, at Montclair, a legendary football and baseball coach for a quarter century. Um, during his tenure, the Montclair High School football teams won 18 state championships between 1940 and 1968. Um, he also coached numerous other sports. And of course, there's a Montclair ice rink named after him, the Clary Anderson Arena. Aubrey Lewis, who died in 2001, was another Montclair High School football great. And then he went on to Notre Dame, where he was a star, as well as the first African-American to captain a Notre Dame sports team. Then in his professional career at the FBI, he was one of first, the first two African-Americans to go through the FBI's training academy in 1962. And later he was a Woolworth executive and he lived in Montclair's South End on Pleasant Avenue. Mickey Franciosi, who died in 2004, was a world-class cyclist who won three national amateur sprint championships, as well as the world's professional sprint championship in 1939. He was hoping to compete in the 1940 Olympics, but they were canceled because of World War II. He entered the army in World War II and suffered serious leg wounds and cycling did ultimately aid in his recovery from them. Then in 1945, he founded and ran the Olympic Shops department store on Valley Road, shown in the right-hand side here. Um, this was between Bellevue and Lorraine. Um, the, nod, uh, the name nodded to his dream of competing in the Olympics and a bicycle hung on an interior wall of the store. I do want to mention that the Olympic store, um, which no longer exists, is uh, looks nothing like this now. The building has been completely um, redesigned to reflect a modern take on the Tudor revival style. Um, some notable people in the civic and community sphere. Um, the first we'll mention is Charles W. Anderson and his wife, Annie. Um, they donated the land for Anderson Park and they developed key buildings in the Upper Montclair Village, including everything on the south side of Bellevue Avenue between Valley Road and the train tracks, um, including with their son, Robert, developing the Bellevue Theater. And in this picture on the right, Charles and Annie are on, um, in 1887, what was Wachong Avenue, just a dirt road. Alice Huey Foster, who died in 1940, founded the YWCA in a living room of her Forest Avenue home because she recognized the need for a space where black women could socialize. By 1920, the YWCA had 600 members, which was 29% of Montclair's female African-American population. She was also the first African-American to graduate from Montclair High. Now she, in the cemetery, shared a plot with her sister and a headstone and finally got her own headstone in 2017, thanks in great part to the congregants of St. Mark's Church. Frederick T. Gates, who died in 1929, was the director of the Rockefeller Foundation and an ordained Baptist minister. He built a prairie style mansion at 66 South Mountain Avenue, which you see here. Um, it's a very prominent building in Montclair. And his um, cemetery plot has a sarcophagus style um, grave, which has classic Greek details on it. Frank Fellows Gray, who died in 1935, was a Boy Scout pioneer. He founded one of the first troops in the United States in 1909, which has become Montclair's troop number four. He also helped organize Girl Scouts in Montclair around about 1912, 1913. And he founded Camp Glen Gray, uh, which began as a Boy Scout camp in Bergen County in 1917. 
Um, Joseph Van Vleck Sr. was an architect in New York City with Sterrett and Van Vleck, and they specialized in early 20th century department stores. But for Montclair residents, he would be best known for designing the Mediterranean style villa in Montclair at 21 Van Vleck Street. Um, this went up in 1916, and three generations of Van Vlecks lived there. But to us, it's known as the Van Vleck Gardens because Joseph's son, Howard, um, created this beautiful garden in the back of the building, um, which is known especially for its rhododendrons. Um, fittingly, on this bench where the family graves are, the decorations are oak leaves, which are a symbol of power and strength as well as eternity. Also in the gardening sphere is Barbara Walther. Um, she was a driving force behind the formation of Mountainside Park in 1921 in Upper Montclair. She was also a horticulturalist who led the citizens committee that was charged with maintaining the Presby Iris Gardens, which were established in 1924. There are many other notables um, that have wound up here. Most recently is um, Olympia Dukakis, who just died this year, uh, 2021. Um, there are people in the music field, for example, Reggie Lucas, who uh, was a Grammy Award winner and also produced Madonna's debut Borderline album. Um, people who belong to the artist colony, um, people in the politics and music and literature field as well. Many more that you see here on this slide were inventors. Um, they dealt with inventing the stock market ticker tape, uh, dripless candles, uh, all, all order of things technical. In the military world, I think some of the most heartbreaking um, memorials are here. One of them is for Paul Gannett Osborne. Um, who died during World War I in 1917. He may be Montclair's first World War I casualty, and he's definitely one of 71 Montclair men to die in that war. His name is on the Edgemont War Memorial. He was a volunteer medical transport driver with the American Field Service, the Dartmouth Unit, and he died of gangrene a few days after being wounded in France. Although his headstone is in Mount Hebron, his body is in France, um, which um, is a reminder to us that cemeteries are also for the living because his headstone in Montclair provides a form of consolation to his family, even though his body couldn't be there. In fact, after World War I, 40% of those who died there, 40% um, of the Americans who died there were buried in eight permanent American cemeteries in Europe. Another World War I casualty is Chapin Crawford Barr. Um, he was the first US Marine aviator killed in action when a bullet pierced a major artery in his thigh. And his headstone here has a, a plaque that gives a brief account of what happened. And I'll read that to you. It says, while on air raid over enemy territory, he was attacked by a superior number of enemy scouts. In the fight which ensued, he behaved with conscious gallantry and intrepidity, and despite having been mortally wounded, he drove off the enemy and brought his plane safely to the Aerodome. He also is buried in an American cemetery in France. And um, his name is one of seven congregants of St. James Episcopal Church, um, whose names are engraved on the bells in the Memorial Bell Tower at St. James Church. Another World War I casualty is Theodore Wallace Todd. He died in Flanders, Belgium, and his name is also on the Edgemont Memorial. And I just wanted to note that there are many other headstones that denote military service, and we chose to focus on these three World War I um, headstones, which really uh, you know stood out to us. And uh, we'll go on to interesting headstones, um, but before we discuss them, uh, I wanted to just point out this large structure, which is a receiving vault that's near the front entrance of the cemetery. 
It was designed for temporary storage of bodies when frozen ground and snow prevented digging graves. Uh, now with backhoes, we don't usually have to worry about that, but the last time the receiving vault was used was in 1996 after back-to-back -back snowstorms. This is a, um, a headstone for the memorial home of Upper Montclair for aged people. It's a large headstone for a communal plot that has room for 25 burials. The memorial home still exists in a house at 185 Fernwood Avenue as an assisted living facility for women over 65. Another large headstone for uh, a communal plot is this one for the Fourth Methodist Episcopal Church. It memorializes the graves that were relocated in 1926 in order to build a YMCA on Washington Street, the present site of the Bullock School in Montclair. Um, so just to give you your bearings, here's Bloomfield Avenue and here's Elm Street, and um, this is Washington Street. In the Fourth Methodist, um, the Fourth Methodist Episcopal Church had been, re by this time in 1906, had been renamed the African Methodist Episcopal Church. And the cemetery was located um, across here, what is now the southern edge of the Bullock School. Bullock School is here, and the Bullock Playground and Parking Lot are here, and this was the former site of the, um, of the cemetery. But while they were building the Bullock School, they, uh, human bone fragments and a deteriorating coffin were found on the site. After a study and um, archaeological report, the school construction was allowed to proceed, and those items were properly relocated. Relocations of entire cemeteries were actually not uncommon. In 1876, after um, and another burial ground below what is now the Siena Condominiums on Church Street, uh, which was associated with the first Presbyterian church, the church for Church Street, uh, for which Church Street was named, was also moved to Mount Hebron, although we have read that the grave is unmarked and we still need to do a little research on that one. There are several natural boulder headstones in Mount Hebron Cemetery. Uh, the rock it symbolizes uh, the Lord. We have also counted three rose quartz markers and um, particularly liked that this one seems to have been hand uh, handmade, the nameplate for Joseph Willie, who died in 1927. We believe that he died, he was a carpenter who died in an accident. Many headstones and inscriptions reflect our area's cultural diversity. Uh, this one for John and Eva Peck features an English quotation by James Montgomery on one side and lines from a Polish Renaissance poet, Jan Kaczynowski on the other. Here we have the Wong family plot and it's um, significant because it not only reflects the cultural heritage of the man buried there, but the loving devotion of the remaining family members who tend this plot so lovingly. Uh, Lisanne and I always noted that something was always blooming here and it was so well kept. And one day we saw one of his daughters on her one of her weekly visits tending the plot. She explained her parents were some of the earliest uh, Chinese uh, residents in this area and had one of the first Chinese restaurants in the area in Clifton. She explained to us what these inscriptions mean. This one uh, is her father's county of birth. The center symbol is um, means the pregnant one or yellow, which is the symbol of, for his family name. And on the far right, you can hardly see that one, is his canton or region. The Blodniaks were Latvian natives, very active and prominent in Latvian activities in the US. There is a Latvian poem on one side of the headstone, um, as you see here. The Wolkoff headstone reflects the Jewish tradition of placing headstones uh, or stones on headstones. Numerous explanations for the origin of this exist. One of them um, is that flowers die, but stones are permanent and the stones represent the permanence of the legacy and memory of the deceased in the hearts and minds of those who knew him or her. While this is most commonly considered a Jewish custom, we have also seen rocks placed on headstones of individuals of other faiths. The cross is a very common symbol. This one includes the monogram IHS, um, which is a symbol for the name Jesus and is a contraction of the Greek word for Jesus. This one also includes this musical symbol, which is an example of personalization um, of, this, of this person, Mark Andrews, who died in 1935. I really like the Celtic crosses. I find them 
very interesting. And there are many that appear in this cemetery and most of the others that you'll see, they're a legacy of the Irish culture. On the left, um, eagle-eyed Lee Fan noticed that this one was actually, um, the stone for this was actually carved in Ireland and imported. And another um, Celtic cross includes a Gaelic saying, Sloan Awanye, which means safe home, as you'd say to someone when they're leaving, such as have a safe trip home. The Eastern Orthodox cross is also seen on several headstones. This one for the Machukas um, uh, is on their headstone. They were from the Ukraine and members of a Russian Orthodox church in Patterson. Some headstones just really make a statement such as this one, which is a real showstopper um, and was certainly intended to be. Rupert Johnson was the, um, the man who started the Franklin Fund Investments. His headstone resembles a fireplace. Uh, it's black onyx with an insert of intricately carved marble that we're told recreates a fireplace he had seen in France. Hard to see, but um, we can tell you there's many thistles represented there, which indicate a person of Scottish descent and also is a reminder of the inevitability of death. The epitaph reads, he hunted the lion. He was an avid big game hunter, but this may also speak to his approach to life. Um, some headstones include a narrative, um, such as this one, which tells the story of a 24-year-old stunt flyer's early death in a single plane crash that killed three men at the Hadley Airport in South Plainfield, New Jersey. Robert Gilchrist Howell owned the plane and was the pilot, and um, that crash occurred in 1928. The Prentice Brunel, Brunel headstone features a lovely and unusual copper cameo portrait. Several monuments feature stained glass, which adds an ecclesiastical touch. And when you see it at the right time of day in the cemetery, you just are surprised by this unexpected and really beautiful ray of color that you see if the sun is shining just right. Um, some graves are just really sad. And this one really rips your heart out. Um, it's for Cedric Hayer who died in 1913 at the age of 11 months and 23 days. And the epitaph says, all our love could not keep him. Some headstones are just very intriguing. Um, this one for Dorothy Noble Petley Jones, who died in 1970, includes a, uh, a French saying as her epitaph, toujours prêt, which means always ready. And the crest that you see here is also very interesting. Um, it's based on the Petley family coat of arms. The arm is in, uh, in armor, garnished with a snowflake and grasping a scimitar. It symbolizes the family's military service in Canada since the mid 19th century. On this headstone for the Odells, we see their personal signatures, which adds a personal touch. Um, and this type of signature uh, is seen on several other headstones at Mount Hebron. Um, personalization on headstones is quite common. Um, in this case, um, for Ernest Christner, he was a transportation inspector for the Great Northern Railroad in St. Paul, Minnesota, um, but he died at home after a long illness at only age 27, but um, he has these wonderful trains. Now, um, Kenny Perteco was um, very interested in rocket ships and um, as a young boy, he would carve them out of blocks of balsa. And this rocket ship on his headstone um, is a copy of one of those that he carved. Um, he graduated from Clifton High and he had been admitted to Newark College of Engineering when he died in a car accident. Mary Travis Arney, um, lived in Montclair. She loved birds. She was a bird bander and a wildlife rehabilitator who was known as Montclair, in Montclair as the bird lady. Um, after a storm in around 1947, she was brought four baby screech owls who had fallen from a tree. And she raised them all successfully and freed them when they learned to fly. And the owl on this headstone is from a drawing that she did of one of those owls. She also wrote several books on local history, um, including one titled Seasoned with Salt, which talks about nursing back wildlife, particularly birds. 
There were a number of mausoleums that dot the cemetery, and this was one of the more spectacular examples. It has not one, not two, but three stained glass windows, all with Christian themes, and it also has text written on the inside in French, Spanish, Italian, and German to reflect the family's multi-ethnic heritage. Um, this uh, is a mausoleum owned by a family that is in the funeral home business and one of its representatives was in the cemetery once when we happened to be there and she was telling us that she's seen many um, cemeteries in her profession but that mom Hebron she considers to be one of the most beautiful in New Jersey. One of my particular favorite elements of the cemetery is the chime tower here. Um, it rings at, around, at 11 a.m. and 2.30 p.m. Um, and it also seems to ring at other times too, because I've heard it when I've been there in the late afternoon. It was designed by a Montclair architect named Arthur Ramhurst in 1933. Um, he also designed several notable homes in Montclair, as well as some commercial buildings such as the Tudor Revival Bradner's Pharmacy in Wachan Plaza, which is now a frame shop. Um, he himself is buried here. He died in 1962. We've mentioned some epitaphs already, but there were some additional ones that caught our attention and include um, this, which is this long one, which is a husband's poetic tribute to his wife, Arzi Van Geisen, who died in 1917. The poem is My Wife by Robert Louis Stevenson. And a few more uh, other parting words. The first one for Roderick Burnham, who died in 2013, the Cox curse ends here. Roderick Burnham had a hereditary disease that was passed down through the male line of his family. Realizing that he was the end of the hereditary line for the disease, he and his wife, Nancy, made a conscious decision to not have biological children so as not to potentially pass along the disease to another generation. Uh, Lisanne happened to bump into his wife uh, or speak to uh, his wife and she said that he wanted this statement, the Cox curse ends here on his headstone. And uh, Margie Irene Washburn Wells has a very long narrative on her headstone and the last line will really get you. It's for the headstones for her and her unborn child. And it says, and God left her child with her to keep her company because he didn't want her to be alone. But there are some not so sad epitaphs too for um, the last one we note here for Mary, the beloved wife of John Chambers who died in 1912. Her life was a noble one. Her thought was for everyone and she was loved by all. We also wanted to spend just a minute to note some current burial trends. And I, I also wanna note that this wall is, um, we wanted to have an excuse to also include a picture of one of the terrace section walls, which in the spring flower like this, and it's really incredibly beautiful that the terrace section is a very unusual section of the cemetery. Um, the Walther and Van Vleck plots are some of the ones that are in the terraced section um, of Mount Hebron Cemetery. But um, so let's talk about some current burial trends. Since 2016, more Americans are being cremated than having traditional burials, and the percentage is expected to increase, according to the National Funeral Directors Association. Both cremains and full bodies are laid to rest in Mount Hebron. In America, there's also interest in eco-friendly natural burial in conservation areas, as well as other options. But those who want a traditional scenic resting place can still find it at Mount Hebron where plots are available. And we'll wrap things up on a very light note with this cartoon that says, I can't believe I ate all that kale for nothing. We also wanted to um, briefly thank Bill McElroy, the general manager of Mount Hebron Cemetery Association and his um, assistant Agnes, as well as John and other caretakers who have given us so much time and information over the years. Also Mike Farrelly, the Montclair Township Historian for all the information that he so generously shares and for the use of the Montclair History Center archives and the Montclair Public Library local history collection to help us put together our presentation. And that wraps it up. I'm going to um, stop sharing. Thank you, Helen and Lizanne. That was great. I learned a lot and I've done the Rosedale Cemetery tour a couple of years and I still learned a lot. So thank <laughs> you. <laughs> uh, any questions from anybody? Feel free to unmute yourself or you can chat, put something in the chat. What was that ball like uh, in the beginning? The ball, the ball yes. Oh. What did that represent? 
Well, we don't know what it represents except um, perhaps wealth because it's very, I mean, we um, thought that it was probably a very expensive monument, um, very classic, um, sophisticated, uh, you know, it, and, and like I said, it's the only one in Mount Hebron, although I've seen some in Rosedale, right, Erin? Yep. And I saw a bunch of them at Greenwood. And I saw one at the Sleepy, the Sleepy Hollow Cemetery. Um, but uh, they, my understanding is that they're expensive to make. So you need to have a certain amount of wealth to be able to afford one of those. Thank you. Um, just looking through the chat, somebody was asking about Shirley um, Booth Baker, if her husband grew up here. And actually, I don't think we know that. That's a good question. Um, I'm just looking, let's see. Uh, Carolyn um, Steinitz, wife of Wilhelm, the world chess champion from 1886 to 1894, is buried at Mount Hebron. Okay. I have to look her up. <laughs> Um, if anyone, you can just speak up if you have any other questions. And um, yeah, somebody says, um, um, we would like to hope we can go in person again soon. Yeah, hopefully we can, maybe um, maybe in the spring or next fall. I mean, it's beautiful there in the spring um, and, and the fall. It's a, it's a really beautiful cemetery. Um, you know, Rosedale is also beautiful. Oh, but that, that sold out. Aaron's got a tour on the 31st, but it sold out. <laughs> but you're welcome to tour around there, Rosedale Cemetery, if anybody missed out on the chance to catch that tour at the end of the month. Uh, Rosedale is always open. You're welcome to walk through and they have a wonderful map with some, you know, major sites listed on their website. So it's an easy place to get yourself a tour there as well. Um, we had uh, Kevin ask, did you mention what is the oldest cemetery? Uh, I'm not sure if you mean in Montclair or in the country, but I assume Montclair. <laughs> uh, Helen or Lizanne, do you know, um, do you know any uh, off the top of your head? Well, are you asking what's the oldest um, headstone or the oldest burial plot in, Mon in, this, in, the, in the cemetery? I don't think we uh, know. I Old I mean, we, burial in Mount. Yeah, I, I see that clarification. I mean, we have seen there's one from 1846 that um, is among the older ones we've seen, and that caught our eye because that was um, a date before the cemetery was officially incorporated. Um, you know, it's possible that there are some older there. There's certainly dates on headstones, like there's one that person that we mentioned, Samuel Pope, whose um, headstone says. 1814, but we're not sure if he's actually there or if that was just um, documenting some family history. So we don't know the actual oldest one, but there are ones that predate the cemetery's incorporation by several decades. And those are in the, they are in what is um, the oldest section of Mount Hebron um, near an old entrance on Mount Hebron Road. Um, and it could have been that they, it was, you know, yeah, an informal burying place um, or, you know, just not a cemetery association. Um, someone asked about vandalism. Think, you know, I, I'm not aware of vandalism. I don't see vandalism there. Let's hope that remains the case. I'm just scanning through the chat here. Okay. Um, go ahead, Rita. It's Rita Singer. Uh, about Alan Dumont, yep. the, uh, the one who introduced us to Dumont Television. Yeah. Uh, it's interesting. You say that he lived up at the Cedar Grove border, or in Cedar Grove. I was told that he donated his land to form Brad Bradford Food. Do you know anything about Well, he had two. I happen to know a little bit about him. And I know the person who lives in his house now. Um, so um, he lived in a house on Bradford Way, a little Tudor Revival house. That was the first house where his laboratory was, his first laboratory. Um, historian Phil Jaeger lives there now at, with his wife, Jean. And then he moved to a bigger house um, near there with much more property. And that may, um, that may back up to the Bradford pool area. I don't know about that, but it's definitely in the vicinity. So, but I don't know about him donating land um, or any of that, but it, there, it's, he's right there in the neck of the woods. Um, 
somebody said we didn't mention the terrace area. We didn't specifically mention the terrace area. I, that I made sure we included a picture at the very end that was the rock wall with the yellow flowers blooming out of it. That's one of the incredible sights you see in the spring. Um, and the Van Vlecks and, the, and Barbara Walters, um, they're in the terrace section. Um, it, it's, um, it, it is what it sounds like, a terrace section, um, several several on the easternmost side. Uh, and it's just several layers of um, terraces with uh, very private uh, plots. Um, the walls give you a little bit more privacy and it's very unusual, very beautiful. I think there was somebody who asked whether there were any Civil War casualties. Um, there may be, but we don't know of any. We have seen, I think, Civil War veterans, but not someone who actually died in the Civil War. We've also seen um, veterans of the Spanish-American War, um, but not someone that, as far as we know, died during that war. Yeah, a lot of headstones have. That's sort of why we just sort of picked the World War One. There's a lot of headstones that have some symbolism of, um, you know, a, a service in the military, um, and um, it, you know we couldn't recognize all of that. And the, the World War One stories were sort of particularly interesting since many of them weren't buried there. That sort of caught us. Um, why does the tower chime at eleven and two thirty? When do you think it should chime? <laughs> I will say. <laughs> I, I assume that the Cemetery Association picked up for some reason. Maybe they thought it was a time when it wouldn't wake anybody up. <laughs> you know, people are supposed to be awake at those hours. Right. Um, but it does also chime at other times as well, because I've gone walking there. I mean, I, I like to just go there for a beautiful walk. And I've been there at like five and five and six in the afternoon. I'm not here the chimes. So I think that they've expanded their chime time. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of chiming going on in that neighborhood because Montclair um, State also is uh, reactivated their chime tower and that every hour on the hour from seven to seven. <laughs> uh, I think they do a little they do a little ding on the half hour too. So Helen, yeah, you were reading Seasoned with Salt and somebody else was yeah. had also mentioned it. One of people, and I are reading it. One of the people that you mentioned um, like maybe right after uh, do Alan Dumont, somebody who did um, Morgan. Yeah. Uh huh. So when you're reading Season with Salt, you'll come across a point somewhere in the story where all the youngsters were going to. I think it was Adam Morgan's dump. Yes, absolutely. Up. I yes, and that would be where my mom and dad and his friends would all go to pick up the crystals to make their crystal radios. So it must oh. have been the one from the shop that he had or the laboratory that he had after the one in his garage. So that that's the Adam Morgan yeah. connection to Seasoned with Salt. Okay. <laughs> Um, somebody mentioned there's also a large uh, pat or lane. There's also a large mausoleum in the lower area. Yes, they have a large mausoleum. Um, I think they they may have two um, mausoleums down at the the sort of the low the, the easternmost edge of the cemetery. And I believe I, Olympia, Olympia Dukakis is buried in in that area. Other than that, I don't I don't know a lot about the um, the mausoleum that one. Thank you. That was quite interesting. Very, very much appreciated. Oh, Good great. night. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. Thanks Any for coming. Any questions or comments or anything? All right. Oh, I see one more thing came through. Oh, yes. Thank you. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everybody, for joining us. I'm so glad you could join us. Again, if you missed anything or you know anybody who missed the noon one, uh, this got recorded. So this will be up on our YouTube page in a couple of weeks. You'll be able to catch the whole thing. Didn't miss anything. Uh, that'll be up for free on our YouTube page. Um, next History at Home is Thursday, November 4th. We're going to be going over the Nolan plan there. Should be a lot of fun. But thank you all for joining us. Good night. Thank, Thank you, you everyone. Bye.